Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is March 28th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone is doing well today. So a few stories that we're going to talk about today have to do with the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, some of President Trump, some recent tweets that he's sent out recently, and then that will segue nicely into a discussion on health care and Obamacare, because I think this is going to be front and center in the very near future. Plus, we are entering the 2020 presidential election, and it is a it is a health care mania for everybody. So I think these are very important issues to discuss, start laying the groundwork for our philosophy here at the Capitol News, and sort of starting to frame the argument as to my belief as to what the proper rule of government ought to be in general, and then specifically when it comes to health care. But first to Adam Schiff. So if you recall, Adam Schiff remained silent immediately following Attorney General Bill Barr's release of the summary of Bob Mueller's investigation. But you have to recall that Kellyanne Conway, an advisor to the president, came out, I believe it was on Monday, attacking Adam Schiff. Again, rightly so. I have no problem with this. Adam Schiff is a very, very shady figure. Very. He has been dishonest, flat out lying, just perpetuating a bunch of propaganda in regards to President Trump, his campaign, his administration, Russia Trump collusion, the whole gambit. The whole gambit. So Kellyanne Conway came out and said, This man needs to resign. He needs to resign. He should be ashamed of himself. He was out there with the whole lot of them. And this guy was really front and center in this whole thing over the past two years, pretty much telling everybody in the country, everybody in the world, that President Trump is going down. Not only is he going to go down criminally, so he's going to be indicted, he will be impeached, he will go to jail. It's this obvious to this man. This is what he says. And not only President Trump, but it's going to be members of his family, member of his campaign, administration, the whole list. This is what he said. Now we have the summary that came out. No, not the case. Not the case. The president, his campaign, his administration has nothing to do with collusion. Nothing whatsoever. Then there's no evidence, or at least not enough evidence, to go after the president in regards to obstruction of justice. That was the finding. That was the determination. Now, we had that argument yesterday in regards to, well, why did Bob Mueller punt that responsibility? Why did he put that on a political appointee in the attorney general? This man spent a lot of money, Bob Mueller did, over two years. He was charged and tasked with making a decision, making a conclusion. He said, nah, you know what, Attorney General, you make that decision. Well, he did. Bill Barr did, and he said there's not enough evidence to prosecute or go after the president on obstruction of justice. So that's where we are. Now, a lot of people are eating crow. A lot of people have to eat humble pie. As we know now, MSNBC and CNN, two of the largest networks that were pushing this propaganda, that Trump and members of his immediate family and administration were going to go down, now their ratings are off a cliff. Their ratings are off a cliff. And is it any reason why? Should we be surprised by this? People are fed up. They've been lied to. you got a president out there that's tweeting fake news, fake news, fake news, and these Watchers and listeners of CNN and MSNBC say, wow, this, this old guy's crazy. He's nuts. He's a loon. Well, it turns out that all these stories they were peddling for the past two years turned out to be nothing. We knew this. The people who were watching these respective networks, it was all groupthink. This is what they wanted to happen. They don't like the president, and that's fine. You don't have to like the man, but they were not objective. They were simply turning on the television and trusting the people on these networks. That's the power that the media has. This is why I tell everybody, do not simply listen to these people. They get paid, a lot of them, especially if they're in prime time, get paid millions and millions of dollars a year to basically read a teleprompter. Now, if you were paid millions and millions of dollars a year to read a teleprompter, you're going to read exactly what is on that teleprompter because you want that money and you want the lifestyle that that gives you and your family. Well, they're no different. They're no different. And they have an agenda. 
And that's exactly what they were pushing. They were pushing an agenda. They wanted Trump to go down. That sold ad revenue. That got advertisers into the ball game. That got people watching. And then it turned out to be nothing. So it wasn't a question of being objective, of being honest, of reporting the truth. This had to deal with money. The anchors who get millions and millions of dollars or six-figure salaries. And for ad revenue, for the corporations who manage CNN and MSNBC. This is a disgrace. This is very scary. Because you have to understand, the average Joe and average Jane out there, they're working for a living. When they come home, they are placing trust in these organizations to report the truth. Not an agenda. The truth. They didn't get it. And now the ratings are falling off a cliff. And it's very scary. And even though the president says fake news, sometimes it isn't fake news, too. So you got to be careful on both sides. But the argument is there, and it's a legitimate one. I mean, at the beginning, some people were really hesitant and skeptical. Ah, fake news, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Well, it is. It's very much fake news. In a large sense. And this just proved that out. So the media, they put dollars ahead of the truth. And now I think they're going to be losing a lot of dollars. But in regards to Adam Schiff, obviously, guys, as just previously stated, Kellyanne Conway was out calling for his resignation. Now you have a more formal call by Republicans who sit on the House Intelligence Committee, making it formal today, basically saying, right out in public, reading a letter, saying, Adam Schiff, we do not trust you. We don't think you have the wherewithal to lead this committee. We are asking for your resignation. Now, of course, there was no way in hell Adam Schiff was going to resign. None whatsoever. He's digging in deeper, which is the worst thing that he could do politically. But this is pretty much a godsend to the Republicans because there's no there there. He went off on a tangent, Adam Schiff did, in response to this letter and the calls for resignation. He wants to be holier than thou. He wants to say, well, you might find this fine and okay, but I find it um, immoral and unethical and yada, yada, yada. This whole spiel he went on, the holier than thou thing. Get off of it, man. Nobody's buying it. Nobody's buying it. He still thinks he has evidence to prove that President Trump obstructed justice or there was collusion. We just spent, what was it, $20, $30 million on a special prosecutor for two years who went down every rabbit hole there, there was and there's nothing. How does Adam Schiff think he finally has the last clue? He knows he doesn't. He knows he doesn't. He's just stalling for time because he's dug himself too deep. And now the only way he sees out of it is to dig himself in even deeper and then hope and pray that something happens where he is able to divert attention. There's some other bigger news story. Well, that's not going to happen. I highly doubt that that's going to happen. In fact, this guy is going to be front and center if and when, and I hope it's a question of when, President Trump does go through and declassifies FISA documents, FBI 302s, and a whole host of other things. Because Adam Schiff is going to be front and center. Just like Andy McCabe, Jim Comey, Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, Nelly Orr, Fusion GPS, the Clintons, the whole lot of them, they will be front and center when President Trump declassifies this information. He might even be front and center when some of these uh, inspectors general reports come out. Because he knows, and he's had conversations with members of Fusion GPS. Now, when Devin Nunez, the Republican, the former chair of that committee, the Intelligence House Committee, when he had sort of, uh, well, some iffy, iffy discussions with the White House, he was called on by Adam Schiff to resign or to have an ethical investigation on Devin Nunez. Well, that happened. There was an ethics investigation into Devin Nunez. Nothing came of it. But at least Devin Nunez was like, all right, you know what? If that's the appearance, then we'll look, we'll step away from this. We'll do this, that, and the other. Adam Schiff, no. He's digging in, digging in deep, and this will backfire. So I think the Republicans did a smart move here, calling for his resignation, which was something very simple to ask for, knowing perfectly well that he wouldn't resign. And now everybody's going to know what a fraud this guy is, because this was his out. He could have said, you know what? You're right. We have to put the country first. We've just spent two years investigating the president, his administration, his campaign, and we found nothing. We're not moving forward. But guess what? This country has to move forward. 
They gave him an opportunity to spin, to say, let's put the country first, let's put this behind us, and let's see what happens from there. But he didn't. He didn't, because he's delusional. He's another lunatic. This is the world we live in. This is the United States of America. This is why nothing is getting done, because these people are at the helm. And it's only going to get worse until you have these documents come out that are declassified, and it names names, and then it's just open for everybody to know that this has been a witch hunt, and this is going to be a permanent stain on the history of the United States of America. And let's hope and pray to God that it never happens again. But that's where we are. So pay attention to this, because it's not going to go away for quite some time. Now, some of the other things I want to talk about. Well, one thing, this is quasi-political. I'm going to discuss this on the economic podcast as well. But it's worth mentioning, because there's politics involved in it. One of President Trump's tweets was in regards to oil prices being too high. Well, didn't we predict this was going to happen sooner or later? We've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks because the president is sort of at odds with himself, one, calling for a weaker dollar, which will eventually lead to higher oil prices, in the midst at the same time when you have OPEC and Russia cutting their output. So that's a recipe for higher oil prices. So now the president doesn't like this. So now he is calling out and tweeting for OPEC, to not go through with these cuts, these production cuts. Start pumping more oil. We need lower prices. He's arguing with himself back and forth. I told you this was going to happen, and here it is. Now he's tweeting out, get the prices back down, get the prices back down. Why? Well, because GDP revisions came out and they weren't so good to the president. It's not a coincidence that he tweeted this out on the day that there was GDP revisions to the downside, and now there's concerns with the U.S. consumer. And if you have lower oil prices, well, that might transpire and, and transgo into lower gas prices. So now there's more money in the consumer's po pocket, as the theory goes. So that's where we stand with that. I told you that was coming. Here it is. So the president has to understand this. If he wants a weaker dollar, this is what's going to happen to oil. Okay? The other tweet that the president sent out, and this has been a theme that the president has been on for the past couple of days, and again, is going to be in the forefront of 2020. And he is saying that the Republicans will be the party of health care. The Republicans will be the party of health care. I don't want the Republicans to be the party of health care. I don't want the Democrats to be the party of health care. I want our political parties to do what they're supposed to do and defend and protect our rights in the Constitution of the United States of America. That's it. That's it. We give these people too much credit, too much money, and way too much freaking power. Why do you want to give them control of an aspect of the economy that represents 17% of our annual GDP? 17% of our annual GDP. Why do you want to give these idiots and it's on both sides because none of them deserve to be in control of this. You, can, you deserve to be in control of your health care, of your health insurance. Not politicians in Washington, D.C., not politicians in your respective states' capitals. You do. This is one of the most personal issues out there, and it is extremely emotional, and rightly so. At the end of the day, all you have is yourself and your health. Your house can be taken away. Your cars can be taken away. You can lose a lot of your nice clothes. A whole host of things. But at the end of the day, boom, all you have is your health. It's very emotional. That of your health, that of your husband or your wife or your children, your mother, your father. I mean, it's very emotional. Why do people get it in their head that, one, nobody trusts government? Well, I shouldn't say nobody. The lunatics seemingly trust them. But nobody likes government. Congress, I mean, we know that. We have the polling data on that. I mean, they are always at the bottom rung of popularity. Nobody likes them. And a lot of people do not trust government. So why do you want to give them more power in something that is so personal and emotional? It makes zero sense. Zero sense. Yet here we are, the president out there saying Republicans will be the party 
of healthcare. No, no, no. Be the party of free market capitalism. Be the party that protects and defends the Constitution of the United States. That's what you're the party of. That's it. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is tell the people, look, the government shouldn't be in your pocket, shouldn't be in your bedroom, shouldn't be telling you what to do with your business. That's what the Republican Party should be. Not about getting in and saying, well, you know what, here's how we're going to run the health care system. Because they can say this because they have a, we have a Republican president right now. Well, what happens when we have a Democrat president, which is inevitable? This will happen some point in the future. Hopefully not in 2020. I don't anticipate that being in 2020. But in some point in the future, there will be another Democrat president. And then where are we going to be? Well, I don't like how the Republicans did it. Now we're going to do it my way. This is insanity. This is why I call this a political football. Because when one party gains power... They're going to want to do it their way, and that's going to just 100% change what was just done. Does everybody see this? This should be as clear as day to everybody, because this is not a hard concept to grasp at all, at all. It's a political football, and politicians know this better than anybody, because politicians love running on something that is very emotional, because if you can make it an emotional argument, people stop thinking. The logic goes by the wayside. It's just emotional. Well, what about the single mother with three kids? What is she going to do? Blah, blah, blah. Well, why don't we have a conversation about what she's going to do as opposed to framing the argument like that? And what is she going to do? Woe is me. Let's have a conversation as to how that's going to get solved. Let's have a conversation. And you can see, let's look at the numbers. Let's see how the government has performed because the government has been involved in health care in health insurance one way or the other for the past 50 going on 60 years. And let me tell you folks, the numbers ain't good for the government. It's no surprise to a lot of listeners of this podcast, definitely no surprise to me, but here's this is where we are. And we have the lunatics on the left running for president saying health care is going to be free for everybody. Health care is a right. No, Bernie, it isn't. It isn't. And calm yourself down. Because you only got a couple brain cells left to rub together. Don't lose it yet. Because I want the entertainment for the next year and a half. Everybody is going crazy. This policy of making the Republican Party the party of health care is not a good move, in my opinion. Because they'll mess it up. Because that's what they do. It's not their job. President Trump might be a business savvy man. When it comes to real estate, when it comes to marketing and promotions, what does he know about health insurance and health care? And who's he going to put in to say, well, I do know what to do? Well, who's that person? What kind of deal is he making? What company does he work for? Who's going to benefit? That sounds very much like the swamp to me, doesn't it? This country is supposed to be built off of law and off of free market capitalism. That's it. That's it. Do what you want. Don't hurt anybody in the process. You infringe on somebody else's rights. You destroy or vandalize their property. You got a problem. But otherwise, you do you. I do me. I do me. And everybody's happy. That's all it is. Round and round we go. If you don't like what I'm doing, don't come into my store. If I don't like what you're doing, I'm not going to buy what you're selling. It's that simple. Why people can't accept this is beyond me. Everybody's got to be in everybody's business. That is the antithesis of what this country is based upon. You're supposed to be free. Go do what you want. If you don't like it, don't do it. If you like it, do more of it. <laughs> it's so simple. It's, it's just, I, I'm scratching my head here. I just don't get it. But here's some other things, and this is from The Cynic's Guide to Investing. This is our book, because in the book, we talk about a lot of things, because obviously 17% of the economy is something worth discussing. And when we wrote this book... It's written in four parts, and in the part that talks about health care, it's in part two of the book where we talk about trends and demographics because we want to look at the trends in health care. And obviously, when it comes to health, it's very much, it's, it's very closely associated with the trends and demographics because the older you are, the more likely it is that you're going to need more health care. 
And so what are going to be the spending costs and, and all of that stuff? So where are the investment opportunities in that space? That's what the premise of the book is about. But here for this argument, I just simply want to talk about the costs. I want to talk about where we were, the United States was, back in 1960 and where we were in 2010. So over a 50-year span. Okay? Just to give you a picture, an idea, for those of you who think that the government is best suited to tell you what to do in regards to your health insurance choices and your medica medical care choices in thinking that the government can somehow manage it better than the free market economy. Okay? So let me just give you some straight numbers here. All right? I know it's not the easiest thing sometimes when you don't have the numbers right in front of you and you don't have a graphic, but let me just read this to you, okay? 1960, U.S. population, 181 million people. U.S. total health expenditures, 27 billion. Health expenditures per capita, $149. $149 per person. Gross national income, $548 billion. Gross national income per capita, a little over $3,000 per individual. Health expenditures per capita as a percentage of gross national income per capita, 5%. 5%. We're at 17% now. We were at 17% in 2010. So at least we're sort of steady there. It's still not good, but at least we're there. But back in 1960, it was 5%. Now, let's look at where we were in 2010. U.S. population, 309 million. U.S. total health expenditures, 20, I'm sorry, 2.6 trillion. We were at 27 billion in 1960. Now we're at 2.6 trillion in 2010. Health expenditures per capita, over 8,000. 1960, it was $149. Now it's over 8000 per capita. Gross national income, over $15 trillion. You know the GDP numbers. We talk about that. Gross national income per capita. Now we're at $49,000. In 1960, again, it was a little over $3,000. 2010, 49000 And again, health expenditures per capita as a percentage of GNI, gross national income per capita, 17%. Does that look stable to you? I mean, if you graph it, I mean, it's just it's just straight up. Is that what you want with your costs? You just want your costs to keep going up? You want a bigger and bigger bureaucratic mess? Because that's exactly what you're going to get. I mean, Obamacare wasn't even ruled out on time. They had nothing but time to do it right. They couldn't get that right. And now that is going to be struck down to be unconstitutional because it is unconstitutional because it changes in a very fundamental way the relationship between the government and the citizen. And what do I mean by this? Well, let's just take a very simple example. You, we have speed limits, right? We have speed limits. Nobody denies this. If you go above the speed limit, especially if you're 10, 15 miles over the speed limit, 20 miles over the speed limit, you're going to get a ticket. Obviously, if there's a police officer there, you're going to get a ticket because you did something. You broke the law. Now, when you had Obamacare, if you didn't do something, you were taxed. You were fined. You didn't. You did not buy health insurance. You did not act. Well, now we're going to punish you. You understand how much power this gives and gave to the government? Because now mommy and daddy government can tell you whatever, whatever they want you to do. And you got to do it or you're going to be fined or taxed. That's the precedent that was set by Obamacare because they called it a tax. That was the constitutional ruling from the Supreme Court at the time in 2012. That was the ruling because it was Chief Justice John Roberts who came down and said, look, the argument that the government was making, advocating obviously for Obamacare, was an extension of the Commerce Clause which has been abused to death over the years. Believe me when I tell you. There were four justices who said they're fine with that. They were fine with the Commerce Clause. Chief Justice John Roberts was not fine with an extension of the Commerce Clause, but he said in his majority opinion, it is constitutional because I am going to declare this a tax. 
this is well within the rules of Congress to levy taxes. So that's how they got around it. We were told constantly by President Obama himself that this was not a tax. Well, it is. That's how the Supreme Court ruled. That's what kept it to be constitutional. Now, that's ludicrous. The whole thing is going to get shot down because the mandate was repealed by President Trump and the Republicans. And now that basically strips the entire, I don't know, what do you want to say, the enforcement mechanism behind Obamacare. So now the whole thing is going to fall flat. But this goes right back to my argument of it being a political football. This is going to upend the entire system once again. And now we're going to have something else come through. Maybe it's going to be extremely difficult to see how anything gets pushed through because we are in a political year and we have the House controlled by the Democrats. So I don't know how something is going to be passed. I really don't. I really don't. But we'll see what happens. Now, just for context, as I wrap this up, I'm going to read a couple of sentences out of the Cynic's Guide to Investing in Relations to these numbers, just so you have another picture in your head as to what takes place when the government gets involved in your life. Okay? So I'm just reading simply here. Next, we simply provide total health expenditures for the years 1960 and 2010. And as was noted previously, this represents an increase of approximately 9530 or a per annum basis of 9.6%. A 9.6% per annum return would be a great return if you're an investor. You would take that every day of the week, twice on Sunday. That's the increase in costs that the government gave you. Now you compare that with how much you, you earned in gross national income, and that was an increase of 57 so you have 9.6 in the increase in cost per year in health care, but your income only went up 5.7. Is it any wonder why people are living paycheck to paycheck? Is it any wonder why the vast majority of Americans, in the event of an emergency, couldn't come up with $400 cash? And you're telling me this is the greatest country on the planet? You're telling me this is the economic miracle, the best there ever was, give me a break. This is disgusting. This is the government at its finest, or at its worst, however you want to look at it. This is what the government does, because it wants to tell you what to do. Don't listen to the idiots on TV who want to frame this as some sort of emotional argument that you have a right to health care. You have a right to your life. That's what you have a right to. You have the right to be happy. You have the right to succeed. You have the right to opportunity. That's what you have the right to. You do not have the right to a good or service, to somebody else's labor. When you go see a doctor, you're going to see, see him or her for their skill, for their knowledge, for their labor. You have the right to somebody's labor. That's called slavery. And we abolish that. You know why? Because it's disgusting. Now you just want to enslave a whole bunch of other people. You want to put the government in charge of 17% of this economy. And if the government gets involved even more, it'll be an even bigger piece of the pie. You people better wake up because you got lunatics out there saying it's a right and they want to offer it to everybody. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you as always. I am most definitely going to continue this conversation because it is very important. Check out thecapitalnews.com. I wrote an article on this earlier this month. Please check that out. Leave your comments. Add to, to the debate. And I will continue to put out other little policy memos and articles as we continue because this is very important. I'll catch you guys next time. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.